Tenakoto Kato, um, thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many friends and colleagues here this evening. I'm sticking around for my glasses so I can read my notes. Um, I'd like to thank um, Provost Professor Wendy Lana for her kind words of welcome uh, and to acknowledge the Pro-Vice-Chancellor Pro and Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Professor Jennifer Windsor, as well as many other colleagues, friends and family. I'd also like to acknowledge those who can't be here today, many of whom have sent their regards. Um, this includes colleagues who are involved in the International Cultural Sustainability Symposium, which is happening in Wellington just now, uh, which looks like to be a fascinating meeting. I, I was tempted to go there myself. <laughs> I'm afraid we've just missed the wine tasting um, that's part of that uh, symposium, but the meeting does last until Thursday, so please look at our university website if you're interested in um, attending any of the sessions. Um, so what I want to talk about this evening is the dynamism of language, as the uh, title slide suggests, but also importantly, the dynamism of language users. That is, not only can we think of language as being a dynamic system, showing many different types of variation and changing over time, but also we need to remember that language users are dynamic and are continually adapting to both variation and change. Um, I should also thank Wendy for uh, mentioning one of my um, article titles and my use of puns, and I do promise not to have too many dad jokes in my presentation this evening, but there will be one or two, uh, most of which are not um, of my origin. So we're all probably familiar with um, everyday experiences of variation uh, and of anecdotes um, from visitors to New Zealand who talk about what an online chicken might be, or who wonder why the national airline has fears to suit every traveller. Um, I think I'll have a dose of arachnophobia, please, but just hold off on the fear of, uh, fear of heights until we've landed. Uh, most likely, we've had our own similar experiences when we travel overseas and experience um, different accents. But while visitors and longer-term immigrants like myself may continue to notice such phenomena, confusion is rarely lasting, and over time, um, these uh, phenomena seem to become less intrusive as we adapt to all the accents around us. At the same time, of course, there is the complaint tradition. Letters written by um, public, members of the public to editors of newspapers and to magazines, such as the New Zealand Listener, uh, which are rich with grumbles about young speakers not being able to speak clearly or properly, or moans about TV ads featuring the number of earbags in a new model of car. Um, objections that young people are so racked with self-doubt that they're continually asking questions rather than making statements. Yes, up to all. Uh, something which has been referred to as an irritating verbal tick. Uh, on the subject of earbags, uh, you can now get them from Amazon. <laughs> uh, brilliant at this time of year for keeping your ear, ears warm. Uh, and uh, they include a rather fetching faux leather model that you can get as well. <laughs> so, on the one hand, um, these kinds of reactions that I've illustrated here uh, and the results to those reactions um, illustrate what's perhaps an undisputed truism about language, namely that despite our King Canute-like attempts um, to stop the tide, langu language will continue to change. But on the other hand, these um, circumstances um, show also that although we might at first be thrown by unfamiliar accents, for the most part, we are able to rapidly adjust our perceptual system to what we hear. That is, we show accommodation in our perception for speech, just as we do in our production. Not only do we start to sound more like the people around us, but we also start to listen like them. Research in a number of areas of linguistics has shown how languages and language users are fundamentally adaptive and evolving systems. Variation in language affects all types of representations, uh, sounds, the words that we use, the sentence structures that we build, the meanings that we give to words. <coughs> there are a lot of factors behind such variation uh, and behind the more durable, chains that, that, more durable changes that frequently emerge from variation. Uh, these include speaker-related factors such as the age of the speaker, the sex of the speaker, the speaker's educational or social background, as well as contextual factors such as the setting in which the language is being used, the nature of the interaction, and so on. However, a lot of our understanding in the area of research uh, that, that Wendy has introduced, known as psycholinguistics, the area that I work in, uh, that's the understanding of how we produce and comprehend language. It's based on an assumption of relative stability. That is, until fairly recently, researchers have investigated phenomena in language production and comprehension 
as though they were static objects rather than the moving targets that they really are. And as stated in the introduction to a recent collection of scientific papers in this area, which I've given on the, on the slide, um, it's somewhat surprising that psycholinguistics, which after all, after all deals with language production, language comprehension, and also language uh, learning, um, has neglected variation phenomena. And there's certainly some truth in that claim. Uh, for instance, the word cloud that you see there, in which, uh, part of which formed um, the picture on the invitations that came out for this lecture, uh, that word cloud is based on an analysis of the text of my introductory textbook on psycholinguistics. And the top 200 content words in that text, so by somebody who works in psycholinguistics and has published an introduction to the field, the top 200 content words include no terms that have anything to do with language variation and language change. At the same time, the journal Language Variation and Change, uh, which does deal with that area, uh, has very few articles that deal with processing. I looked through recent issues, and uh, one out of 12 of the most recent, one, one article out of 12 in the most recent issues has anything to do with psycholinguistics. So there is a, uh, a disjoint between uh, language variation and psycholinguistics, uh, which is only recently starting to uh, get itself sorted out. So what I want to do in this lecture is to provide an overview of some of the research that I've been involved with, uh, which seeks to explore how the processing system deals with and exploits variation in the speech signal. And that research connects to two areas that are crucially important in understanding speech. Recognizing words, <coughs> words being the basic building blocks of language, um, and understanding sentences. And my particular focus will be on variability in two areas of New Zealand English. The individual speech sounds of this uh, variety, not all of them, I'm just making a selection you'd be pleased to hear. Um, and those individual speech sounds, of course, are important for our um, recognition of words. We need to uh, understand what the sounds are before we can find out what the words might be. Uh, and the other area is the tunes that are used in intonation patterns, and they contribute to our interpretation of um, spoken sentences, and that goes back to some of my very early research. And these two areas have formed what I, I see as a natural continuation um, of the research that I was involved in before I came to New Zealand. Uh, and in a way, New Zealand English, as a relatively new variety of English, lends itself to such investigation because of the rather large number of changes that are taking place, uh, both in the pronunciation of individual speech sounds, but also in the types of intonation patterns that are being used. And then finally, what I want to do is try and link those two threads together and report on a recent study that I've carried out that looks at how information from variation at the level of individual speech sounds uh, can be used in a predictive way to help interpret patterns of intonation. So let me start with word recognition. In the early part of uh, my career while I was still in the UK, I was privileged to work alongside a number of leading scholars in the area of psycholinguistics. Uh, and I continue to remain grateful to them for the learning opportunities that working with them have provided for me. Alongside other projects, one of the issues that we were looking at was the efficiency with which listeners use detailed cues in the speech signal in order to rapidly identify and recognize words. Uh, of course, one task that listeners confront is knowing how to break continuous sounds into words. Uh, in written text, the job's usually made easier by having spaces between words. Um, I've given you an example of written text without the spaces. You can probably work out what those words are because you know some words and you can spot words in that string of letters and work out what the, the rest of them would be. Imagine the task that a young child has to do when confronted with a speech of sound and not having any words to uh, latch on to. Uh, they have to do a lot of work to work out where words exist in speech, where words begin, where words finish. So in written text, we've got spaces. But in spoken language, we don't always have spaces between words. We might pause between phrases. We might pause between utterances. But we run words together within those phrases, within those utterances. However, there is some useful variation in speech sounds that does give us clues um, to where the word boundaries might be. And that information is, use is useful because it's generally quite predictable. And I've given you a couple of examples on the slides. And the first one is that the, the k sound uh, is more heavily aspirated, it's got a larger burst of air accompanying it uh, in the sequence discard compared to discard. And that's a useful cue to uh, where a word might be beginning. And the S sound is longer in one spade than it is in once paid. Again, a useful cue to the beginning of the word. In addition, there's also variation in pronunciation that helps us to identify um, which words we are listening to earlier than we might otherwise be able to do. And this can then speed up our processing of speech. 
So for example, the shape of the vowel sound in words like soup, soon, suit, differs because of where the articulators have to get to in order to produce the consonant after that vowel. And those cues uh, are useful early cues to allow us to identify what the word is before we've perhaps even got to that final consonant uh, in the word. Um, and when I was uh, thinking about this research, I realized that it's now 30 years uh, since I first published an article that looked at those kinds of phenomena. Um, but I, of course, haven't changed one bit since then. <laughs> Okay, in addition to variation that's predictable in this way and informative for the process of, of recognizing words, there is also variation that results from non-linguistic factors, that results from um, the speaker's sex, the speaker's age, the context in which the speaker is, is talking, and that can be predictive of those non-linguistic um, features. And some of the early research that I carried out on arriving here at Victoria was shaped by my background in this general area of spoken word recognition. Together with my own experiences on first arriving here, uh, when I encountered what was for me a novel accent, but also an accent that I soon recognized was undergoing some rapid changes. And as I noted earlier, these changes make New Zealand English a particularly fertile research area. My research in this area has considered some of the consequences for this process of word recognition that arise from differences in dialects and from sound changes that are taking place in an accent that a group of listeners might be listening to. So we do adapt, we do adapt dynamically, we adapt to variation. Um, most of you are probably very familiar with the idea that we adapt our behaviors in response to others around us. Uh, for example, we may converge with our interlocutors in terms of our speech sounds, uh, and even in terms of the sentence structures that we use. So there are a number of interesting studies that show that we uh, start to use sentence structures which are very much like those of the speakers we interact with. Uh, and a particularly interesting um, finding there is that that happens a lot more when you have to deal with heavily accented speech, where presumably we are having to concentrate a lot more on what we're listening to and focus on the detail rather than just grasping the general meaning. And, uh, and in focusing on the detail, uh, we do, of course, then pick up on uh, aspects of the sentence that we might not otherwise notice. Uh, there are, of course, other forms of convergence. <laughs> Um, we should note, of course, that in addition, there is an incre there's increasing evidence of divergence. So we don't just become more like the people we identify with, but we also uh, often become less like those who we do not wish to identify with. And so divergence is an important aspect too. Now, in terms of um, how we perceive and interpret the speech of other people, as I mentioned earlier, while we might initially find it difficult to understand accents which are not familiar to us, we're usually able to make some rapid adjustments to our perceptual system, uh, to what we're hearing. And this kind of accommodation in our perception for speech is an area of research that I've been involved in over the past couple of decades. And in the psycholinguistic area, uh, the most current thinking is that uh, the way this happens is that we have memories for speech events, uh, so-called exemplars, uh, which include not just the memory for the speech itself, but also aspects of the context in which we heard that speech, who the speaker was, what their social background might be, what their age is, and so on. Uh, and uh, I want to use that as a sort of framework for thinking about some of the things that I'm going to be talking about this evening. So just to return to the examples of uh, fears to suit every traveller and the proliferation of earbags in cars, uh, these examples illustrate a collapse in the distinction between two vowels in New Zealand English. It's not a new issue, it's one that's been commented on for 30 years or more. Uh, in the terminology that's often used to talk about varieties of English, the vowels involved in this collapse are the near vowel and the square vowel. And these labels, near and square, should be used, thought of as labels of convenience for talking about vowels that could be quite different in different varieties of English. So the near vowel is one which in my own British variety of English is found in words like fear, meaning dread or anxiety, uh, ear, so the things that you hang your glasses on, um, rear for um, back or behind. And the square vowel is the vowel that I would use uh, uh, to talk about the fare that you pay for your journey, the air that's compressed into the safety devices in your, uh, in your car, uh, and rare, meaning um, infrequent. Now, young speakers, or younger speakers of New Zealand English, typically merge these two vowels. Uh, so much so, in fact, when I lecture on this topic to the New Zealand English course uh, uh, at, at third year level, 
I have to check very carefully that the students know which veil I'm talking about. And after a while, I see this look of confusion. And I think the audience here probably will be able to follow the difference between near and square. But with my younger audience in the, uh, in the lectures, there's this look of confusion. As they, as they, I, can, I, I realize they're not following me anymore. And it's not because I'm talking about really obtuse subjects, but because they can't work out which veil it is I'm talking about. Is it, is it cheer or is it chair? Which one am I talking about? So near and square are quite useful labels to be able to talk about these vowels once you get the uh, difference established. Now the difference, the, the, sorry, the, the um, direction of this merger in New Zealand English is typically um, uh, towards the near vowel. So that while older speakers of New Zealand English and speakers of other varieties like mine uh, will we'll distinguish between the cheer that you shout and the chair that you sit on, younger speakers might produce, produce both as cheer. And this is reflected in these uh, reported mishearings that you see on the slide. Uh, so somebody misheard fares as fears, and we have fears to suit every traveller, and so on. And you can also see it in the word plays that you get on the, um, on the notices there. So the pub that says, beer with us during our improvements. Um, wonderful sign. They want you to have their beer, but also they want you to bear with them to show patience. Uh, and spear a thought, for spare a thought, um, spear referring to the asparagus that you can see lurking at the bottom of that picture. So if we think of the um, young New Zealanders as listeners, then we can see that there's something of an asymmetry. They hear older speakers producing distinct cheer and chair forms, but they hear their contemporaries producing cheer for both. Uh, and in a series of studies, many of which have been carried out in collaboration with Jane Hay, who I acknowledge on this slide, uh, who's a Victoria alumna and now professor of linguistics at the University of Canterbury. So in a series of studies with her and others, I've explored the implications of that asymmetry and of how the results of ongoing sound change might affect spoken word recognition. And I want to talk about a couple of those studies now. So how is variation interpreted in the course of recognition of words? Uh, words in particular which have those sound patterns of fear, ear, fear, cheer, and so on. And how is the interpretation of that variation in pronunciation affected by known or perhaps assumed characteristics of the speaker? In one study, I measured participants' response times to words in what's known as a priming task. Now priming, uh, just by way of explanation, uh, priming studies rely on the fact that when you hear one word, it activates a network of related words so that when a related word is subsequently heard, you are faster to respond to that than if you had heard that word in an unprimed condition. So to back away from near and square, cheer and chair, uh, to give you a more obvious example perhaps, um, participants uh, listening to a priming word doctor and then hearing the word nurse will recognize the word nurse faster than if the sequence they had heard was doctor, uh, sorry, was table and then nurse. So doctor primes nurse, table doesn't prime nurse. Now the words we used in our study included a large number of sequences of words such as cheer followed by shout, or chair followed by sit, but also crossed pairs so that cheer would be followed by sit and chair by shout. Uh, and we also included other sequences where there was a different relationship between words just to distract participants from that pattern. Uh, and also we had a lot of nonsense words like schlunk, which I hope is not a word of English, but when I introduce nonsense words to my undergraduates, they say, but that's a word. And then they explain to me what it means in, in uh, contemporary colloquial teen speak. Is schlunk a word? Yes. Yes? <laughs> make, make up your own non-word. For each token, for each stimulus that they heard, each word that they heard, they had to decide, is this a word in English or is it not? So just a yes-no response. Yes, it's a word, no, it's not. And that's known in psycholinguistics as a lexical decision task. You're making a decision about whether something is lexical, it's in your lexicon. And in those kinds of tasks, the primed words are typically responded to much more quickly than the unprimed words. So, let me um, talk about two experiments using priming. Uh, and these are both experiments were, that were carried out with young New Zealand English speaking listeners. And in the first of these experiments, participants heard a speaker from their own age group, but one who happened to maintain a distinction between the near and square words. 
And the participants were faster in responding to sit after chair. So they hear chair and then they hear sit. Okay, they're nicely related. The chair is what you sit on. They're faster in responding to sit after chair than uh, to sit uh, in an unprimed condition. And that indicates that they recognize chair, even with that more conservative pronunciation, uh, even though it's from a younger speaker. Um, and that shows that the connections between chair and sit uh, made it easier for them to recognize sit than if it were in the unprimed condition. Unsurprisingly, they were also faster in responding to shout after cheer than in an unprimed condition. However, hearing cheer also primed them for sit, whereas hearing chair did not prime them for shout. In other words, there's an asymmetry in the priming that reflects their experiences as listeners. They hear cheer from younger, merging speakers as both the shouting activity and the thing that you sit on. I've tried to show graphically what's happening there. They access the cheer and the chair when they hear cheer. Um, sorry, I've lost my place here. Um, so they, they access them as both of these things. Um, from speakers that don't merge those two vowels. Um, but they, but they uh, access chair. Uh, sorry, I've lost my place completely. So it's this asymmetry uh, in the priming reflects their experiences as listeners. They hear cheer from younger speakers as both the shouting activity and the thing they sit on. Um, uh, but when they hear chair from people who don't merge the two vowels, then they only hear the meaning of the thing that you sit on. Now remember that in this experiment, listeners heard a speaker of similar age to themselves. And there are aspects to a speaker's voice that help us to identify things like their age, their place of origin, and so on. And the field of forensic linguistics makes use of these features in criminal cases when giving advice on speaker identification. And the assumption in our experiment was that listeners uh, would pick up on these cues and realize that the speaker was likely to be one whose near and square vowels would be similar i.e. was a younger, emerging speaker like themselves, even though they actually heard some cases where there was a clear chair now. Now, in a second study, I used an older speaker in what was otherwise a replication of that first study. The older speaker was in an age group that still maintained that distinction between near and square vowels. And this time, chair, again, primed to sit, as you would expect. Chair, primed to shout, as you would expect. But the asymmetry from the first experiment with the younger speaker has now disappeared. Chair now primes shout more than it primes sit, and chair primes sit more than it primes shout. And this is just what we would expect in the context of an older speaker. The pronunciation cheer is a more typical pronunciation of the shouting word, and the pronunciation chair is more typical of the piece of furniture. And this pair of experiments indicated that the characteristics of the speaker can influence listeners' perceptions. In this case, we didn't tell listeners how old each speaker was, and so we have to assume that the ages of the two speakers were inferred from their voice and affected the interpretation of these two vowels. Uh, in terms of exemplars, our memories for speech events, the listeners activated a set of exemplars that were appropriate to the age that they thought the speaker had. In another study, we gave participants a different task which was simply to identify words as having the near or square vowels. And they heard two voices in the experiment, a female voice and a male voice. And the stimuli were preceded by photographs that purportedly showed the speaker. And the purpose for the, of this, as far as the participants were concerned, was that they, so that they knew whether they were going to hear a female voice or a male voice. But unknown to the um, participants, we switched the photographs so that for some of the participants they saw a young female, and for the others, they saw an older female, and similarly for the, for the male, um, supposed male speaker. And this was with the same voice stimulus that they heard. So they saw different photographs, but the same voice. So one female voice, two female photographs, one male voice, two male photographs. And the results showed that our, our participants were sensitive to the age that was suggested by the photographs, because they performed more accurately when they thought they were listening to an older speaker, as shown by the photograph. In other words, it looks like they're switching off their discrimination when they thought they were listening to a younger speaker who would not make the distinction between these two vowels, but not when they thought they were listening to an older speaker. 
And so on the basis of the age of the person portrayed in the photograph, our listeners adjusted their perceptual space. Or in terms of exemplars or, or those information-rich memories for speech events, the older photographs triggered the set of exemplars associated with older speakers. And this set of exemplars has greater separation of those near and square vowels. And we have found uh, similar results for uh, other kinds of um, social variables that predict the occurrence of these near and square variables. Now, listeners also appear to be sensitive to some other contextual effects. Uh, in one of our experiments, we had two research assist assistants who had the job of welcoming the participants, settling them in, giving them the response uh, papers that they had to write their choices on, and so on. We actually gave these participants two tasks. One was a production task. They had to read out a list of words containing these near and square vowels. And the other is that they had to do uh, this very simple um, decision task. Um, which word am I hearing? Am I hearing beer, the drink, or bear, the animal, uh, when they're presented with a stimulus? And we got a rather unexpected result, which we only noticed once we'd finished running the experiment. And that unexpected result was that the participants who'd been met by one of our research assistants, who happened to be an American English speaker, um, those, those participants made a much clearer distinction in their own renditions of these words than the participants who'd been met by our other research assistant, who was a New Zealand English speaker. This is an interesting accommodation effect, if that's indeed what it is, uh, in that it occurs in the absence of any genuine interaction with the research assistant who simply handed out the forms and, and read some instructions, uh, and also in the absence of the particular vowels that we're interested in being spoken by those research assistants. Their scripts were deliberately written so that they didn't produce these vowels because we didn't want them to be biasing um, the responses. Uh, but they biased them anyway, despite um, our, uh, our caution. And we believe that it's simply because of the, uh, the voice setting that is conjured up by hearing somebody speaking with an American accent rather than somebody speaking with a New Zealand accent. In the perceptual task, however, uh, those participants who were met by the American English research assist assistant performed less well at discriminating between the two vowels. And, and we conjecture that, that this pattern of results came about because the effect of the United States researcher, the American researcher, on these participants was to set up an expectation of a strong difference between these two vowels. And that resulted in the participants themselves making a strong difference in their own productions. But when they then heard the New Zealand English vowels, they were both much closer to one of the American English vowels than to the other. And that in, that impeded their ability to hear them as being different. They were collapsed into a single set as far as the American English vowel system was concerned. Uh, and that pattern didn't happen with the New Zealand English listener, that, that um, conflation. Uh, just as an aside, I should acknowledge that um, Jane Hay, with whom I did this um, study, has since taken this series, a series of studies a lot further, and in uh, very many imaginative ways. Indeed, in one study which compared the possible effects on vowel perception of thinking that a speaker might be a New Zealander or an Australian, Jane and her colleagues uh, down at Canterbury found that the mere presence of a stuffed toy in the room <laughs> correlated with a difference in perceptual discrimination. The participants were all speakers of New Zealand English, and they heard a set of vowels as more Australian-like if the stuffed toy that happened to be in the room was a kangaroo <laughs> rather than a kiwi. <laughs> well, these studies with vowels have shown that when listeners carry out perceptual tasks, they can adapt their perceptual systems to speaker characteristics, whether these characteristics are actually carried by the voice itself or suggested by photographs of ordered speakers, uh, by the identity of the experimenter, or even by stuffed toys. When we uncovered that experimenter effect in particular, I started to get very worried about all the previous research that I had done in the UK, where we hadn't thought about any effects of the experimenter on how people might behave in that experiment. Uh, I suspect it's far too late now to go back and reanalyze those results for possible experimenter effects, uh, as the identity of the graduate research assistants that we might have employed then is probably lost in the mists of time. Uh, but we should at least be mindful of such effects when we uh, run subsequent experiments. <coughs> 
Now, I'll come back to those near and square vowels in a while, but I want to move to the other area of, of research and speech production and reception that I've been, uh, and perception that I've been involved in, uh, and that concerns intonation, the tunes that we put on utterances. In previous research, I looked uh, closely at how speakers and listeners use different tunes and different types of phrasing uh, to resolve grammatical ambiguities. Uh, so how do we signal in our speech the difference between John saw the woman with the binoculars where the woman is carrying the binoculars or where the man is carrying the binoculars? And there are ways in which we can do this through our phrasing. Uh, but also we um, will uh, make differences between um, while Mary was mending the sock, it fell off her lap, and while Mary was mending, the sock fell off her lap. And we would normally punctuate those in written English, and we punctuate those in our speech through the different intonation patterns that we use. Now, on arrival in New Zealand, I found myself drawn uh, deeper and deeper into the investigation of one of the more distinctive tunes that uh, Wendy mentioned earlier on, uh, the one that's strongly associated with New Zealand uh, English, as well as with other varieties of English. Uh, and this is the tune known as the high-rising terminal, high-rise terminal, the uh, antipodean interrogative, uh, or the more neutral term that I prefer to use, uptalk. Uh, if you search for high-rising terminal, HRT it's known as, if you search for HRT, <laughs> as I had to do when I was writing my uptalk book, you get a lot of hits which are not really relevant. <laughs> if you search for high-rise terminal, you also get a lot of hits which are to do with the development of airports. <laughs> So you sift through those and you, you come up with actually quite a, a rich um, source of information about uptalk across the, uh, around the world. So uptalk can be described as the use of question-like intonation on statements, on declarative utterances. However, like the merger of near and square, uptalk has received considerable attention from letter writers, from the media, resulting in some rather less complimentary labels, such as the moronic interrogative, uh, into the irritating verbal tick that I mentioned earlier, uh, and the real credibility ki killer. So let me give you a bit of background on, on uptalk very briefly. So if you haven't noticed uptalk, I'm sure most of, you, most of you have, it's this use of rising intonation at the end of statements. <coughs> and this is a curiosity for um, the following reason. Normally we would ex expect statements to be associated with falling intonation, because falling intonation shows that an idea is complete or final. Uh, and that's a, if there are any linguistic universals in terms of intonation, it's that falling intonation or low intonation shows the end of something, and rising intonation shows that the uh, things are still open. And so it's not surprising that rising intonation is um, usually linked with questions. Although I have to point out that not all questions will have rising intonation, because we can mark questions in other ways by using uh, what we linguists refer to as WH words. Where are you going now? I think that was a fall at the end of that. You don't need the rise to show the question. Um, however, um, speakers who um, use uptalk, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, have been criticised. Uh, both in the media and in advice columns, there are plenty of advice columns telling young people how to speak, uh, for being, they've been criticised for being uncertain about what they're saying and for having to raise questions about what they're saying all the time. Uh, that's not a surprising conclusion to reach given the relationship between uh, rising intonation and questions, uh, but it's not really an accurate picture of how uptalk is used or how it's interpreted by those who do use it. A little bit more by, back, by way of background, uh, it's not something, uptalk is not something which uh, we specialise here, just, uh, just here in New Zealand. It's also widely found in Australia, parts of the US, Canada, to a certain extent also in um, South Africa, the Falkland Islands, believe it or not, and, uh, and the UK. In the UK, it's um, ascribed to people watching too many Australian soap operas. <laughs> It's also not just found in English. Uh, the yellow patches on that map are um, countries where I've uh, encountered reports of uptalk like intonation being used with the same kind of patterns as it is in English. Uh, possibly here under the influence of English as a second language. Now, unfortunately, the negative perception of uptalk as showing uncertainty is, is compounded by the association of that form of intonation with young female speakers and with a negative stereotype of such speakers as being more insecure and less certain of what they're saying than other speaker groups. So unfortunately you encounter um, depictions of uptalkers as being ditzy, 
um, and, and, and it's typically associated uh, with those younger female speakers. Now, while there's historical evidence that um, young women were more active in the uptake of uptalk, there's plenty of evidence that this form of intonation is now used by older speakers and by males. Uh, indeed, there are some studies that have shown greater use of um, uptalk amongst older males than amongst um, any other speaker groups. But here's an example of an older female uh, who you may have heard recently. I can't quite believe it's happened. I'm still coming to terms with it because, um, you know, she's just gone from the deputy and just got the by won the by-election at Mount Albert and now this has happened. Uh, so if you don't know who that is, that's Laurel Ardern, mother of the new Labour Party leader, Jacinda Ardern. On, uh, that was her reaction to the news when she was phoned by um, Radio New Zealand. Um, so it is typically associated with young women, but it's not only used by young women. Uh, but it is typical in uh, the patterns of many language change in that it seems to have been initiated and carried forward mainly by uh, young women. A lot of innovation in language is, um, is carried by young female speakers. And so it's no surprise that the, to, to us in the linguistic community at least that the young women may have introduced this way of speaking. And we just don't believe that, that's, uh, that, that the reasons for it are the ones that are given in the press. So why do they uh, use uptalk? Why do people use uptalk? Uh, well, in contrast to that common claim that it shows uncertainty, it's been shown to be used more with statements that the speaker knows to be true, uh, as we saw, heard in that example just now. Presumably Laurel Ardern, Ardern knew all those facts that she was relating uh, and wasn't questioning them. Uh, but also, studies that looked at the types of interaction in which uptalk is used have shown that uh, it has a positive role in actually fostering interaction. So recall that a high-pitched intonation typically has an open meaning. It's keeping the floor open. It's inviting uh, other speakers to participate in the conversation. Uh, and so it has that positive um, uh, role of keeping the communication channel op open and drawing others in. Now, in my, my recent research, I've been looking at the forms of uptalk intonation and particularly exploring the question of whether uptalk intonation is perhaps different from question intonation in how it's actually produced, in, the, in the, the, the detail of how people produce those rises. Uh, previously, it had largely been accepted that uptalk and question intonation were the same thing. They sounded the same. Uh, but what I was interested in finding out was whether there were any um, differences arising between those two forms of intonation. And in that research, I used, amongst other sources, um, some speech recordings of participants taking part in the collaborative task that's become known as the MAP task, um, because what happens is that one speaker has to describe to another speaker a route through a map. The speaker describing the route knows what that route is, the other speaker does not. Uh, the features on the map are slightly different from one another, they might have different names, some features may be on one map and not on the other. And so there's a lot of negotiation going on in this interaction. Participants ask questions of one another, they reaffirm to one another that they've understood, and so there are lots of different types of interaction that take part during those conversations. And from those recordings, I extracted utterances which had final rising intonation patterns. And from the transcripts of those recordings, I then categorized those as either being true questions or as being examples where the speaker is checking the listener's engagement or is managing the conversation in other ways, so some of the typical uses of, of uptalk. And it turns out that in New Zealand English, uptalk intonation differs from question intonation in a couple of interesting details. The first is the starting point in time of the rise for, the, uh, for that final um, up flick, if you like. Uh, this tends to be later in uptalk utterances than it is in questions. And comparisons I've made of different age groups uh, suggest that the difference actually reflects a move towards earlier rises for questions from the younger speakers compared to older speakers. Uh, and another uh, interesting presentation title that I used was um, something along the lines of young New Zealand men rise earlier. Should we be surprised? Something along those lines. So it seems that younger speakers in particular are distinguishing questions from statements through the use of early rises for questions and late rises uh, for statements. 
And the differences are actually very small, but um, consistent. A secondary difference is that uptalk tends to start from a slightly lower pitch level. Uh, and this is one reason why the label high rising terminal may not actually be appropriate, because that's often interpreted as meaning that the pitch starts high and goes higher, whereas in fact, for uptalk, it often starts lower than it would do for a question. Uh, and I've tried to show that in those two um, dashed lines with arrows, that the, the, uh, the blue one would be the it's blue, yeah. The blue one would be the uptalk pattern, so you dip down before rising, uh, and that rise starts later than in the sort of orangey-brown pattern, which would be more typical of a, um, of a question. Um, in joint research that I've carried out with Janet Fletcher at the University of Melbourne, uh, we've used the same map task methodology uh, for both Australian and New Zealand English so that we can make a direct comparison of those two varieties. And we found that both varieties have both later rises for up talk than for questions, and a lower pitch level when the rise actually starts. But they seem to differ in the weighting that's given to those two cues. New Zealand English seems to re rely more on the timing, Australian English more on the pitch level um, from which the rise starts. And in uh, a number of perceptual studies, we've shown that listeners can actually um, reliably distinguish uptalk rises from question rises. So tasks where we simply ask them, is what you've heard a question or a statement, where we've uh, produced a stimuli which could be either. So what I want to do now is try and link together the two threads. The thread of, of the merger of near and square, and the thread that's to do with these intonation patterns. Um, both of these patterns, the merger of near and square, and the use of uptalk, are strongly associated with younger speakers in New Zealand English, and with young women in particular as initiators of change. And in a recently published study, I considered the question of whether the interpretation of um, the variability in the intonation patterns is constrained by the social indexing of the speaker that might be signaled um, by uh, other aspects of the speech that they're using. This is, if you like, a sort of flip side of the dynamic adaptation seen in the studies I reported earlier. That is, as well as finding speaker characteristic, characteristics influence our perception of speech sounds, we should find that hearing certain sounds will uh, help us characterize the speaker, which may then in turn help us to interpret other cues that we're getting from that speaker. So if we believe a speaker is the type of speaker who shows more innovative use of language, uh, will we be more inclined to interpret their use of intonation along the lines illustrated in the studies I've just reviewed? Uh, and so to examine this, I again asked participants to decide whether the utterances with rising intonation were questions or statements. This time, rather than using voices with clearly age-related characteristics or, or rather than prompting their uh, prompting them with photographs of the speakers of different ages, as we did uh, in the uh, near square studies, I manipulated a vowel in a word early in the utterance before the rising intonation. Uh, not surprisingly, this was the square vowel. So the words containing the vowel uh, square in our sentences were words which had no corresponding word which has the vowel near. So an example would be the word cared. There is no English word cared, unless you've been struck by a Cheap eating parrot. Um, the utterances were recorded by a young female New Zealand English speaker, and they were then resynthesized so that the vowel in the word, uh, in this key word, had the characteristics either of the near vowels, so, so for this particular word, it would sound like kid, or, the, or they had the characteristics of the square vowel, so it sounded like the, uh, the kind of uh, vowel you'd expect from older speakers like kid. And I should be able to play you examples of those. Kid. Kid. So that's the cared like one. Uh, kid. Kid. And the cared like one. So it's synthesized from the same um, starting stimulus, um, just manipulating that, the characteristics of that vowel. Um, subsequently, a rise in the utterance after that word started either early or late. Again, in line with those production differences that I mentioned between questions and statements for younger speakers. And these will be really, really hard for you to hear. Um, I hope hearing them. I hear them better over headphones. Uh, what you're going to hear is um, a single 
word, uh, the final word in that last sentence there, animals, with a rise that starts in different places. So let's see whether you can hear the difference. Animals. Versus. Animals. Okay, so an early start. Animals. And a later start. Animals. Okay, so the rise either starts on the first syllable or on the last syllable of the word animals. Okay. So a very subtle difference. Uh, and put those things together and you get uh, the kinds of stimuli that we used. John's mother cared for stray animals. <coughs> John's mother cared for stray animals. Uh, and, and, you, and the same for the, uh, for the other vowel. I won't bother playing them all. So the task that the participants had was uh, similar to the uh, previous studies. They had to decide whether what they heard was a statement or a question. Um, but because I also wanted to get a measure of participants' confidence in their response, I measured um, the movement of the mouse as they moved from clicking the start button on a screen to clicking on the response button of statements or question. Uh, and the measures that you get from this are the choices that they make, uh, are they saying statement or question, the speed with which they make that choice, and how strongly are they attracted to the opposite response, the alternative response. And you can see those different coloured curves there show different measures of attraction towards the alternative response. And in terms of uh, response choice, what I found was that rises with an early starting point were more likely to be interpreted as indicating a question than those with a late starting point. And that's in agreement with, uh, with uh, other studies. Early rises indicate questions, late rises indicate statements. Interestingly, there was also an effect of the vowel manipulation. So question responses were faster when the vowel had the square pronunciation than when it had the near pronunciation. The square version indicates the more conservative speaker, i.e. somebody who's less likely to use rising intonation to show a statement and more likely to be indicating a question. So the question response is the much more obvious one in the context of a square vowel compared to a near vowel. But the directness of the response that people made, as measured by the, the, the mouse track, also showed an interesting result. Um, so remember that innovative, usually younger speakers, are likely to use near rather than square in words like cared, so they say cared. They're also likely to distinguish between questions um, and uptalk through early rises and late rises. And the results showed that when an utterance containing a near vowel also has an early rise, then the question responses show less attraction towards the alternative statement response than for corresponding utterances that had the more conservative vowel. So an innovative vowel signals the type of speaker who's likely to distinguish between questions and statements by having early rises for questions and late rises for statements. So by varying this vowel cue, we were able to uh, produce a difference in how people interpreted the intonation cue. And people were interpreting the two as being uh, compatible. So I hope I've shown that not all variation in pronunciation is troublesome. Predictable variation can indeed help us during speech processing. It can help us recognize words in continuous speech. And our linguistic repertoire is being continually updated by our experiences. And even potentially negative experiences, such as mis the mishearings that I mentioned at the beginning of my lecture, have the potential to alert us to connections that we need to make between features of pronunciation and characteristics of speakers. As listeners, we dynamically adapt to variation in speech features, and we exploit this variation to make sense of what and who we are listening to. Thank you.